and Melissa, we are live. You're on mute. Hi. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Jira Grant. I'm a staff writer at The New Republic, and welcome to our event series, TNR Live. In this series, we will bring to the table issues that are at the top of the social and political agenda, or ones that should be. And tonight, we're going to be discussing how sex workers have shaped the fight for LGBTQ rights and what that means for queer politics now. This is Pride Month, and this is a very untraditional year in which to be celebrating Pride largely indoors. So welcome to Pride. Um, what we know about the movement for sex workers' rights um, is that it has been part of every liberation movement, every social movement in the United States. Sex workers have been part of the gay liberation struggle, part of the LGBTQ rights movement. And the sex worker rights movement now is, is gaining a lot more mainstream recognition, but it has a deep history, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, to start on this week marking the 50th anniversary of Christopher Street Liberation Day, uh, which was itself the first anniversary commemoration of the Stonewall Riots, from which Pride celebrations have grown worldwide, uh, we're going to look back to how sex working people have shaped our queer lives long before Stonewall. Let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Hugh Ryan who is the author of When Brooklyn Was Queer and also the curator of the Pop-Up Museum of Queer History. We also have Cecilia Gentili, who works independently with the Trans Equity Consulting Project. And she has also worked at the LGBT Center and GMHC Gay Men's Health Crisis. And last, we have Red Schulte, prison abolition organizer, curator, archivist at Hacking Hustling, and a buyer and member of the Blue Stockings Bookstore Collective. So we'll all be talking for about 45, 50 minutes together, and then we'll open up to your questions. You can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of the Zoom page to submit your questions, and we'll go through those once we're done. So to start off, I wanna go back to this, this question of what you know, sex working lives and queer lives were like long before Stonewall. Um, and I thought I would ask you to, to set us up for that. If you could sort of set the scene for what the Stonewall riots, the Stonewall uprising was. Um, and, and the parts of that story that is often left out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Melissa, for organizing this. And thank you to the New Republic and to Red and Cecilia. Uh, I, I've seen all of you speak, been at events for, done before, and it's a pleasure just to be here. And to everyone who is taking their time to sit on yet another Zoom panel <laughs> at 7 p.m. Uh, in the middle of Pride Month, you are uh, truly heroes. I'm actually really glad you asked this question because most years I spend pride complaining that we talk too much about Stonewall. Uh, not that Stonewall isn't important, but I think that we talk so much about it and not just Stonewall, but specifically that first night of Stonewall that all the other amazing moments of queer militancy and intersectional activism, both in the village at that time and around the country kind of gets obliterated. You know, we never talk about the Haven riot that came six months later. We never talk about the riot on International Women's Day in 1960 70 in Greenwich Village. You know, these were other violent clashes between the cops, between queer people, uh, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, uh, many of the street people in the village, radical lesbians, all of this kind of gets forgotten. But I will say, there is one part of the Stonewall riots, and particularly that first night of the Stonewall riot that I do want to talk about, because I think that we don't talk about this enough, which is what was happening a block and a half away from Stonewall at the Women's House of Detention. For those of you who don't know, the Women's House of Detention was an 11-story women's prison that sat at the end of Christopher Street, where today the Jefferson Market Library is, that, that little garden there. That used to be an 11-story women's prison. It was built in 1932, and it was torn down in 1974. And on the night of the Stonewall Riot, the first night, the women in the prison could see what was happening down the street. They knew what was going on. And you know, we talk about how brave the folks at the Stonewall Uprising were, and they were, absolutely. But these women were imprisoned. They had nowhere to go, they had no freedom, they had no one to protect them from the guards, and they rioted in solidarity with the people on the outside. In fact, we have records from women who saw them screaming gay power, gay power, setting fire to their meager belongings and throwing them out the windows 
Uh, and yet this never gets talked about when we talk about Stonewall. I actually want to read you, this is a, a little excerpt from Rita Mae Brown, who was at Stonewall on that first, or outside of Stonewall on that first night. And she wrote, I was in my early 20s. It was a very hot night and Martha Shelley and I were walking through Sheridan Square in New York City. The cops in a matter of seconds pulled in front of this little bar. We all knew it was a men's bar and we heard this noise. And the next thing we saw were cops flying out of the bar and patrons came flying out of the bar and they were running in their high heels and we realized, oh my God, it's faggots in revolt. This is heaven. And at the women's house of detention, the women heard the noise, noises and started rioting inside the prison. All the windows were up because it was summer and the women burned their mattresses and shoved them through the bars. And this never gets written up because all the accounts of that period were given by men. The folks who were in the prison that night, uh, and in fact, almost the entirety of the life of that prison, about 50% of the women and trans masculine people who were there were there for sex work related charges. Uh, many, many, many of these people were queer. Many of them were political activists. Uh, and there's, before I, I let go, there's just one other thing about the night, that first night that I want to mention. One of the women who was in prison that night was one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party named Afini Shakur. Uh, she was not only a political activist, she's a writer, she's the mother of the musician Tupac Shakur. And she actually talked about being in the prison during the Stonewall riots, during other actions by the Gay Liberation Front and the radical lesbians. And after she got out, she went to the Black Panther Party's Revolutionary People's Convention in Philadelphia in 1970, and she met with the Gay Liberation Front. And the Gay Liberation Front wrote this up afterwards. Afini Shakur came to one of our workshops. She's one of the New York 21 Panthers now on trial for conspiracy to blow up the botanical gardens. She told us about how she looked out of her prison cell window during a demonstration to free the NY21. Seeing a gay liberation banner in the crowd made her think for the first time about gay people and gay liberation. She then began relating to the gay sisters in jail, beginning to understand their oppression, their anger, and the strength in them and in all gay people. She talked about how Huey Newton's statement would be used in the Panther Party, not as a party line, but as a basis for criticism and self-criticism to overcome anti-homosexual hangups among party members and in the black community. She helped us to formulate what we wanted to say in our list of demands. She worked with the Gay Liberation Front from the moment she got out of the prison. She worked with radical queer women. She worked with early trans journalists to try and connect the Black Panther Party and the emerging gay rights movement because she understood in a truly intersectional way how these movements were all connected and how they all flowed through and together at the Women's House of Detention. Thank you so much. You set us up like completely perfectly. I want to move forward in history a little bit, um, turn it over to Cecilia, um, who everyone should know from the amazing television series Pose also, <laughs> among other things. And I mean, Pose, I think of Pose in this moment and sort of this trajectory of particularly like New York queer and trans history, the fact that it is on like regular ass TV and Netflix and people can watch the stories of trans women of color who do sex work and make community. There has never been anything like that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own experiences in New York, the kind of growth of trans community from that moment to this moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to take you a little bit farther away uh, to Argentina because that's where I'm from. So, you know, at age 17, I, um, I met the first trans person in my life. And I was like, holy fuck, you know, I, I wasn't crazy. You know, it's all the people just like me. So it was such a revelation, like, you know, and um, I met her and, and, you know, and she told me, you know, uh, uh, if you want to, if you want to do what I do, it's three things that you need to know. You're going to be a whore. You're going to get high and you're gonna die young. And, you know, and that was the reality of, of trans women at the time. Uh, for, you know, for a while I thought like, you know, I'm too good to be a whore and, you know, and I don't wanna get high. Uh, and a couple of months after I was like walking the streets high as a kite and, uh, you know, but I always, you know, I'm very, always very surprised that I, you know, I didn't die as young as, uh, as I was expected. And I'm very, very blessed for that. So that was the reality of, of uh, trans people in my country. You know, uh, my country has a long history of going from dictatorships to democracies, to dictatorships, to democracies, and during those periods, like 
trans people were like really, really oppressed by the police. Actually, at this point, some of my friends from Argentina who were able to, um, to prove that they were mistreated by the police are getting a reparations pension. I'm talking about South America. Like South America is giving trans women a reparations pension for the suffering that police put over them. So I, I can't believe it. I'm so happy. So, you know, um, so when I started my transition, I really thought that I would, you know, that that wasn't going to be my, uh, my case, that, you know, that I was too good to, to be uh, a sex worker. And uh, soon after, I realized that I couldn't work anywhere else. You know, I couldn't go to school. I couldn't do anything. And uh, that's when I realized that sex work was going to be my, my job. Right, and I took it very seriously, and and you know it was my profession. And at the same time, kind of like the the conclusion about like starting to work in the sex trade was very. It, it came as a revelation, right? I I realized that you know all these cis men, you know these dudes were like really fetishizing me and like drooling me and like basically like everybody wanted to fuck me. And I had to pay rent, you know? So I was like, hmm, okay, let me just put two and two together. So, you know, I have to say like, you know, for me uh, um, as a trans person, sex work came as something that it was just not only natural, but it was also empowering, right? Uh, you know, when the rest of the world is telling me that I'm a mistake, that I'm an abomination, that, uh, that I am uh, horrible and that my body is wrong. You know, these men are paying money for my time and for my body. So I got a lot of validation that at the time, you know, as a 17 years old, I really, really, really needed. So that's how, you know, everything came together. My, you know, my, my, my studying uh, uh, of transition, my studying as a sex worker, my studying into the LGBT community. But I have to say, and you know, I, I hate to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer, but you know, um, when I started my transition, I also learned of how much power gay men had over trans women. Like gay men were the ones that decided if you were fabulous or if you were not. Right, the the gay men decided if you were um, able to get into that bar or that club, or if you were not, because you were not fabulous enough. So I always, I always have a little bit of resentment against uh, gay men who always had that power over me as a trans woman. I want to turn it over now to to Red to talk some about. I would love for you to kind of bounce off of that one and talk a little bit about other kinds of exclusion within LGBTQ community that affects sex workers, particularly trans and non-binary sex workers. Um, and, and sort of the responses to that, like the ways that sex workers have come together, excluded from the mainstream, sometimes even excluded from within this community, and the, just the decades of work that sex workers have done to make their own community inside this one that, you know, isn't always a welcome community. Yeah, and I'm just, thank you, Melissa, for that. And Cecilia and Hugh, um, I'm so grateful to be in this, this virtual space with y'all. Um, Hugh, thank you for leading us through that history and grounding us in that, in that. And also, Cecilia, thank you for, again, sharing your story so generously. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that we can talk about. Um, I think especially with regard to how we have to work um, how we have to market, how we have to present ourselves, right, um, as it pertains to gender and sexuality, and the tension and the frustration, uh, the dysmorphia, the just anxiety, um, and also these beautiful moments, um, like what Cecilia was getting at too, um, of validation, affirmation, and community. Like it's all of these things, right, when we talk about hustling and also the gender question, right? Um, and it's, 
this that could be a whole other conversation that we have like all night into tomorrow into next week um, but I do want to spend some time thinking specifically about how sex workers have kind of created community and created networks of care and have really been a part of the radical tradition of mutual aid. Um, I know we're hearing that phrase a lot right now. Um, and so I think maybe anchoring um, us in that sense of like what mutual aid can actually look like would be, would be really, could be really powerful. Um, and I think it comes from a couple of uh, pretty systemic and like um, some pretty intense moments. And one of them is that sex workers have been fetishized by the policing industry in this country for at least a century, right? Um, and like cops fetishize the trade, okay? In their practices, in their personal lives, um, in policy, um, and particularly black and immigrant sex workers, right? Feel the brunt of that fetishization from the policing industry. And sex working people, of course, then are gonna have a lot of important things to say about the violence of rescue, um, of white saviorism that's all wrapped up in criminalization. And through those responses, through the analysis that sex working people, particularly black and uh, migrant sex working people through their analysis and community building, we get so much knowledge, so much life-saving, harm-reductive informational sharing that builds and grows community. And I think that, yeah, we can learn a lot from sex trading people about care networks outside of the purview of the state, right? And so that's also kind of where um, I'd like to have us um, take, like, sit with that, right? Um, and immediately the example, um, since we're talking about sex work and community building as queer history, right? Um, the example of Star House comes to mind um, that the street transvestite action revolutionaries established, right, right here in the East Village and thinking about the legacy of providing for one another, right? And even if it's messy, even if it's hard, right? And in the face of criminalization, right, in the face of drug using stigma and whorephobic violence, sex working people have always sought to create our own systems of support and protection outside of the cops, the criminal legal processes, and societally accepted channels. Because most sex workers, right, like what Hugh and what Cecilia were um, getting at, right, is because most sex workers know that those systems will never bring justice, right, um, because they have no interest. There's no vested interest um, in listening to sex working people when harm occurs, right? And so those things have been organically built um, uh, by sex workers and adjacent community, right? Queer community ourselves. Um, and I also wanted to bring in um, this other historic moment of coalition building, if I can, for just a, a second, because as I'm thinking about how um, we learn from one another and how we grow together in community. I'm struck by the 1978 Take Back the Night um, organizing that happened in Boston. Um, sex workers from the Prostitutes Union of Massachusetts joined with the Combahee River Collective um, and many other organizations um, that were radical anti-violence organizations. And I wanted to just share a brief passage um, that Emily Thuma has written about this like black feminist informed, multiracial, multi-generational um, coalition formation um, in her book, All Our Trials. And it's just like, it's eternally life-giving. And Thuma writes, the overlapping black feminist led campaigns um, and for women's safety had a pivotal influence on the city's Take Back the Night Coalition, the first annual nighttime march in August of 78. It was organized by representatives from a broad range of feminist organizations, including the Prostitutes Union of Massachusetts, Coalition to Stop Institutional Violence, Kambahi River Collective, Transition House, Elizabeth Stone House, the Alliance Against Sexual Coercion, and she goes on listing these radical organizations. Reflecting the breadth of the group's concerns, a lengthy manifesto of principles, demands, and solidarity resolutions outlined the group's opposition to violence against women on the street, women on the job, in the family home, in locked institutions, in healthcare, and in the popular media. 
Take Back the Night's variegated demands included more street lighting, stronger rape shield laws, the decriminalization of all prostitution, and public funding of feminist self-defense classes, shelters, rape crisis centers, and even a nighttime women's taxi service. So I just think about those legacies, right, that are still with us. Folks are still finding ways to try to take care of one another. We're still coming up with these cre creative uh, modes of resistance when the state fails us, right? And so as y'all have been talking, I've just been thinking about all of those things, right, and how they're still with us and we can tap into that legacy. It's especially like at the front of our minds now, right, or ought to be. Um, you know, as people are grasping in this moment after the uprisings that began in Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago and very rapidly spread across the entire country, you know, we're confronted in a very visceral way, in an unavoidable way with this, the impossibility of turning to the police for justice. You know, not just when we want the police to be brought to justice for what they do, right? But it's a much broader question of that. Why are we looking to the police to bring us justice? Why are we looking to the police to bring us safety? And in that sort of grappling with that question, I think there's so much to learn from this community, from this history. Um, and the reason it seems like it is suppressed or not considered part of sort of the flow of social movement history is because it is confrontational with the police, because it is radical. Um, you know, there's many reasons we don't know as much about the prison uprising during Stonewall as we know about what happened in the streets. Um, it comes down to who writes the history, and then that gets replicated and who's excluded in community, who has access to the resources to elders to learn these stories, who is able to do the care work of, you know, keeping community alive, the life-giving work of sort of bringing people together despite that exclusion. And, and then despite that, the creativity of finding ways to, to live and thrive outside of criminalization, outside of policing, to, to have something that's actually life-giving. Um, to me, it seems like this is just this giant blinking light of like, here's where the answers are, essentially, right? Like, there is a map, people have been fighting this way for decades, and it's perhaps you have looked away, but it's all here waiting for you. Um, so I wanted to ask each of you to kind of respond to, to that idea, like this exclusion isn't just about the stigma of sex work, but it's the particular kinds of ways that these communities come together and care for themselves outside of those structures. Yeah, you know, absolutely. One thing, Red and Cecilia, while you were speaking, uh, in I, I'm writing a book now about the Women's House of Detention, and one of the things that I discovered in doing the early part of the research, the 19-teens, the 1920s, when a lot of our laws around sexuality and around sex work were being written, our, our modern laws, uh, is that the police actually piloted a lot of what we think about today as standard policing procedures on women arrested for sex work. Fingerprinting, for instance, was piloted on women arrested for sex work in New York City because <clears throat> for two reasons. One, they were arresting huge numbers of women on sex work uh, related charges. Sex work charges in the early part of the 20th century were basically, when, when leveled against women, were almost entirely about poverty. Uh, it was not, in fact, about sex work. And by 1918, I believe, we actually codify that in law. Uh, there's a, a case called People X Rel Miller v. Brockman. Uh, and in it, the court decided that, uh, let me find the exact quote here. They said, prostitution has been defined as the common lewdness of women. The element of hire or money does not appear to be essential. Uh, 10 years later, they found that that law could not be applied to men. So in fact, we're only dealing with women when we talk about these kinds of arrests. And all of these women and transmasculine people were being brought down to the women's house of detention. New York City, in a weird way, during the time when they were knocking out every other space for queer people, and when there were very few spaces for queer women and queer transmasculine people, they made a space in the village by arresting these people over and over and over again and putting them in Greenwich Village. And then when they released them, they would give them at most a dime, which wasn't even enough to get them out of the neighborhood. In this odd way, police, by targeting sex workers and expanding sex work to mean any woman who is poor and improperly feminine, swept up a giant dragnet that picked up all of these women and transmasculine people and deposited them in Greenwich Village. And we know today that arrested women or people in women's detention centers, about 40% of them actively identify as LGBT. So that means they identify vocally 
as having relationships with people of the same sex before they were imprisoned. That's today when we've had the feminist movement, the gay liberation movement. Imagine how many of these arrested women, which again, were being put into Greenwich Village, were queer. In an odd way, sex work and the way that it was policed helped to create the most well-known queer space in all of America, maybe San Francisco, at least the second best. Um, you know, um, I, I can't, I can't um, uh, stop thinking about like the relationship of like um, criminalization of gender and criminalization of, uh, of sex work and the criminalization of sexual behavior and criminalization of sex work, right? For me, when, you know, when I started doing sex work, uh, you know, at the time, I was already uh, breaking the law by wearing a skirt, right? So it's because I'm wearing a skirt, I'm gonna get fucking arrested. I may as well just try to work and like, you know, and, and it, was, it was like, anyway, I'm, I'm gonna get arrested anyways, right? And I always felt like in my case, you know, through my experiences with uh, being uh, criminalized, um, I always felt like it, it was just a, like a reaffirmation of what uh, uh, law enforcement has an identification with masculinity. So uh, in my case, like I always had to see like, you know, cops were just reaffirming the men have the power to do that and to put you down. And like every time that I have been arrested for being a sex worker, it wasn't just about the arrest. It was just a way to put me down. Um, I, I don't know what the process is for a cis woman, but for a trans woman, it's not just to put you down as a woman, but it's also to put you a little bit down more because you are trans. So, and I believe that that's why, for example, in my case, I was like, you know, I, I am go, I'm go, I'm going to continue doing this because this is the only thing that I can do to survive. And, and, you know, you, you can stop me, you know, and, 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 and that's why I think I have this rebellious kind of sense of, of myself because I always, you know, I always knew that I would be arrested. So that's why if it's a march right now, I jump into it. I don't know what we're protesting about. I just protest because, you know, I'm used to it. This is like usual shit for me, you know? So, you know, um, um, and, um, and I guess that's, that's my, my take on, on that. Yes. That usual shit for you, Cecilia. <laughs> Could just like see you. I miss seeing you in person. I miss being in spaces with you in person. Um, I got to see that glorious video of you outside of Stonewall just several days ago. And I was like, yes. <laughs> anyway, so you're just, again, filling us all with like that fiery energy. It was and my, my first time out since COVID. <laughs> so I was like really nervous, not yes. because of the speech, but because of like people around. Everything. <laughs> yes. No, yeah, totally. It's no small thing to have your first public going out during COVID being the day that the Supreme Court decides the Title VII case mysteriously in favor of trans rights, in favor of queer rights, like something that I never thought would actually happen. And to have Stonewall be the place to sort of like welcome you back. Um, I don't know. It seems very fitting. I couldn't very resist fitting. that. I couldn't resist that. My partner was like, oh, you know, we talk about these that you're not going to, because I live with COPD. So like, you know, I have a very specific race. So, you know, we made some, you know, facts about like what we're going to do, what we're not going to do. Right? Mm -hmm. like, he's been complying with everything. But then it was like, I have to go to Stonewall. And yeah. he was like, we talked about this. And I'm like, I'm going to Stonewall. So yeah. if you like it or if you don't, I, I have to be there. So, sorry, sorry, Red. No, don't apologize. I'm so glad you were able to take back that space and take up that space in ways that felt safe and like fulfilling um, for you. And as we're talking about like remembering and also like piecing history back together with like horror story, right? I wanted to also just like think about this connection of, of mutual aid and like making and creating again a little bit um, as we're remembering. And I think it's 
likely because, um, well, no, not likely, it is because of my work with Survived and Punished New York that I'm constantly thinking about the legacy of prison newsletters, um, like inside outside publications, um, which are absolutely physical manifestations of mutual aid. And they're such rich, incredible sources of our movements, um, like legacies, right? And traditions and strategies and debates like heated debates. Um, and I think the first copy of No, uh, no More Cages um, that I ever got to hold in my hands, um, Miriam Kaba brought to one of our early organizing meetings. And I remember actually physically being able to hold one for the first time. This was just a few years ago. And it was a 1981 issue. And there was this review of the book, Prostitutes Our Life. Um, it is an awesome review written by someone on the inside. And in the previous issues that I would get to see later, um, exploring them in the Barnard archives, there was this extensive coverage um, that my comrades and I found um, covering the fight against trafficking and exploitation in the sex trade and also the need for decriminalization of all sex work um, and stories from sex workers organizing for their rights and against police harassment internationally, like inside issues of No More Cages, inside several issues, thinking about um, the um, Alliance for the Safety of Prostitutes and also covering um, and thinking about the anniversary of um, the occupation of the cathedral in Lyon that sparked International Horrors Day. Um, and y'all, I just gotta say like seeing these struggles, right? So PIC abolition and decrim intimately linked within these pages, like there's no understating or there's no overstating like how truly affirming um, that was to see that um, and to see those struggles connected in that way. And it felt like I had found like a long lost relative, you know, like that sense of like, wow, home, you know, um, and to sit with these stories and these artifacts of resistance. Um, it's really something else. And of course, there's a legacy um, for us, right? Of course, um, fighting for sex workers' labor rights, fighting to end criminalization and exploitation and working toward the abolition of police and prisons. Like, of, of course, there's this um, rich tradition um, and linkage. Um, it's, it's, it's there, it's undeniable. Um, and I think that we can be like unapologetic like they were um, in these formations of inside outside organizing um, and they, how they still are. We're still doing this work um, and building upon this tradition. It's expansive, it's radically inclusive freedom work. And I love that we have space to think through those histories, right? And to complicate them and to get them messy for people. There's, there's something about, you know, we can't have our histories unless we have these like objects and places to go to, right? And the way that the prison in absence of having visible sex worker community spaces to go to to tap into that history right i can only think of like one actual like sex worker history archive in the country that's dedicated to that purpose there are sex workers individual archives in different institutions um but we lack for physical spaces that memorialize us that tell our stories and in a way the prisons and jails and then the prison and jail newsletters sort of end up being the way those stories can get passed down right there's my, my whole experience of sort of finding sex worker and community and political activism in San Francisco was around violence, right? People came together around, at that point in time, it was the first um, international day to end violence against sex workers in 2003. And we staged this right in front of San Francisco City Hall very intentionally. Um, six months later, that is exactly where um, the, the very first legal for a brief time same-sex marriages occurred. And there, there couldn't have been more distance between those two realities at that time, even though I also happened to live directly behind City Hall at that time. It felt like sort of my neighborhood. Um, but our spaces were temporary, right? Like we came together in that space and then it dissolved. Um, we had a health clinic and, and we've had a health clinic since the late 90s and that's still there. Um, but it's so easy to erase this community or to try to erase this community. And I'm thinking back to what Cecilia said when she first was speaking about the being this the legacy that's handed down to young trans women that there is no expectation that you will live there there is no expectation that you will be here to carry this on and i feel like <sighs> 
those two things are inseparable, right? This erasure of the stories and history, and then a, a complete lack of commitment to keeping people alive when they are here. And, and that's very painful to, to think about. Um, before um, we go to questions, we still have another like maybe 10, 15 minutes before we go to questions. So just so folks know, if you have questions to ask us, you can drop those in the Q&A. Um, don't be shy, um, or if you are shy, I don't know, you can always email us after, but you know, we're here now for you. Um, I, I wanna kind of bring us a little bit more into the present and sort of like what kind of, given this history of exclusion, given this like history of, of, of making community in the face of that, sort of where that leads us now, like what possibilities there might be um, for alliances between the LGBTQ movement and the sex worker rights movement insofar as they even are separate from one another because sometimes they, they don't feel all that separate from one another and other times they feel very far from one another. Um, and one thing I'll throw out in particular is it felt like this mainstreaming of the sex worker rights movement happened pretty much in alignment with the mainstreaming or at least mainstream visibility of trans rights, which makes so much sense to me that that is how that would, the trans women, particularly trans women of color, would carry this visibility of sex workers. That it wasn't, you know, a sort of like sex positive, um, you know, San Francisco, like sex radical kind of thing that mainstream sex worker rights. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it seems so rare that the people who are most um, marginalized and most harmed, that they end up being the ones to carry the day. That's what it seems like from, from the outside. And then certainly to look at the, the rally in Brooklyn two weekends ago and how massive that was. And speaking of the ability of black trans women to carry the day and carry the banner. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the present a little bit. Just jump in wherever you like. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I had the, you know, the, the, the honor to, uh, um, uh, to uh, start uh, Decream New York uh, a couple of years ago and, um, and everybody that came into the picture at the moment had some kind of uh, queer background and, and identification. Um, and, um, and I have to say, the most engaged uh, were trans people and trans women and, 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 and trans women of color. And I think it, it was also for us it was also for us an opportunity. Usually movements have like a very um, uh, a strong arm of people who are proactive uh, around what, what, what you are moving around, but it also has like an intellectual arm, right? So me as a trans woman, as someone who didn't finish school, you know, I always felt like I could not be a part of certain things. And, because I didn't have an intellectual uh, background to support it, right? I could go into just a protest and like be a body, but I could not be a part of the real solution because I didn't have that uh, academic background to support legislation, right? And the beauty of this, it was like, you know, it was a group of trans women sitting in front of an assembly member or a senator saying, this is what we need to do. And this is how the bill needs to look like. And that is fucking revolutionary. <laughs> you know, when, if you think, you know, of me, you know, I am an immigrant. I wasn't documented in this country for, uh, for more than 10 years. Like, you know, I use drugs for like 30 years. You know, I'm a sex worker. I've been in jail. You know, you really don't think that I'm going to end up in, in a, a senator's office writing a bill. You know, so for me, this, you know, the, the, the movement of and the, the intention of the Cream New York was so empowering and, and it continues to be for a group of trans women that have been told that they don't have a place in any activism because they are trans and um, it has changed my life uh, dramatically. You know, when I think about uh, the present moment, one of the things that keeps coming back to me through this research and um, through 
just living in New York City and, and knowing people here is this idea of who owns and who makes space, right? Particularly when we talk about queer space and particularly when we talk about the Greenwich Village, the pushing out of queer youth of color, of sex workers, of people who did not have other public space that has happened over the last 20 years of the village has been really terrible. The suburbanization of the peers uh, has just been awful to watch. And when I look historically back at the history of the Women's House of Detention, what I see is that these women and trans masculine people, many of them queer, many of them people of color, created culture on the street. That's something that everyone tells me over and over again. People say to me, the only place I ever saw lesbians on the street, visible lesbians, was outside the prison in the 1950s. The only place I saw butches, the only place I knew to look for people like me. Uh, as far back as 1939, Walter Winchell, the gossip columnist, says that the house of detention makes the village queer, right? These women who we have forgotten entirely today and trans masculine people who are even more forgotten because they had to live their public lives on the streets, they made space queer. Every space they walked into, they made it queer. And those same people are doing that work today and they are still being criminalized and still being pushed out. And instead we're saying, no, it's the people who own these buildings, who put up a flag in the window. It's their neighborhood, right? And I just think it has never been that way. And until we acknowledge that history, we will not be able to see the present moment for what it really is. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't help but think about my comrade, Alicia Walker, um, who's a queer criminalized survivor of violence and former sex working person. And like the way that she's talked about pride events, the way that she's talked about community, the way that she's talked about specifically needing things like International Whores Day, right? Like needing days of celebration to like anchor um, herself in. And she said prior to being incarcerated, she didn't know about a day like International Whores Day um, and didn't really give Pride or Pride Month any kind of passing thought. Um, but now that she's locked up and she knows about these things, um, she's used the words like, I need it, I need this. Um, and she needs to know the way that she's characterized this. Um, specifically because she wants to feel connected to thousands and thousands of sex workers worldwide um, who rise up together and demand an end to police brutality, right? And state-based violence. Um, she's written so many poems um, about this and has done extensive um, speech writing and like statement writing um, about the pride, like heartache and necessity of Horror's Day and like in our present moment and has like anchored that um, in a lot of her inside activism and talking to people about these events or celebrations on the outside and brings them inside um, to Decatur Correctional where she's currently caged. And her poetry always centers like a powerful call to action um, to dismantle the police state, to defend each other from violent clients um, and to build a world that values sex working people and survivors of violence. And I think it's incredibly prescient, it's incredibly of the now um, to think about the kind of inside organizing that folks like Alicia are doing. Um, and it's imperative that we remind our fellow queers of the radical roots um, of so many of our days of celebration that they hold. Um, our pursuance of joy, I think, is undeniably linked to our acts of resistance and refusal of the state supremacy over us. And that, that's what I hear when I hear Cecilia talk about throwing yourself into the street and being this like intellectual leader because you are and the way I hear Hugh you bringing us into that history of how people are making space and taking up space and really like thwarting this state supremacy over over us our bodies our identities um, our lives um thank um thank thank you you know I, I I need to take a minute to like really um, acknowledge uh, the good queer woman, you know, the good lesbian, because I have to take a minute to remind everybody that it's a lot of them that they are not, right? It is, it is a very strong movement of a trans exclusionary uh, 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 lesbians. Most of them are lesbians who have also denied, you know, my existence. And also those people are the ones that are uh, against sex work, decriminalization of sex work. Uh, 
uh, they're most likely the one that the C sex work as an oppressive um, uh, interaction and, and 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 they hate it. So I, I just I really I really needed just to to put that out there to highlight uh, the good the good lesbian the good queer woman that has been supportive of not only of trans people uh, but also um, uh, of sex workers and uh, the queer boys too to the ones that take that risk there are not many there are not as many as I would like let's put it that way it kind of feels like sometimes there's like a gendered split in queer sex working community where cis men now have sort of their own space and own community within gay community that's very different than the way that femme sex workers exist in in more femme sex worker community and I, one thing I wanted to say earlier was just sort of, uh, you know, about the way that these these stories get sort of dismissed or fetishized is because these are the intellectual contributions of femme identified people, right? The, these are the contributions of people out in the streets. These are not coming necessarily from the walls of institutions that have elite respectability. And, and I think that's a huge part of it as well. And so when we talk about the fact that these communities are formed, by policing the acceptable boundaries of womanhood and femininity, that only makes sense, right? Because this is sort of a, a particular expression of femininity that's also being suppressed. And that contributes to why, what sex workers have contributed intellectually and politically um, is seen through that lens of somehow frivolous or, or not as essential because it's coming with this femme posture and this femme um, sensibility. Um, I think, I'm gonna check in on our Q and A, um, and <laughs> this is an easy one. Apologies if this is a shallow question. Red, where did you get your shirt? Not a shallow question. It's a fundraising question. Um, so this was, uh, it's a fundraising item from uh, BYP 100's DC chapter. Um, they are always throwing down and helping with Decrim Now DC um, and that amazing formation of folks. Um, it's like really leading the charge um, in DC to decriminalize um, folks' lives and decriminalize survival um, for folks in the sex trades. Um, I can probably find a link and drop it in the chat. Um, while we're while we're doing this, but uh, it it goes to a good place, and uh, it's not a shallow question. You should support BYP one hundred in their fundraising because they show up for sex workers. Um, the next question, and this can be for for anyone to take. Um, can you tell me what the fetishization of sex work means? Um, I I think like uh, in my case, it wasn't fetishizing me as a sex worker it was the fetishizing me as a trans woman right and uh i you know i am all for fetishizing if it's gonna bring me money right so if you pay me you can fetishize the shit out of me like it's totally fine i, I don't care as long as you pay me money right um and uh, so you know for me that was a i that that kind of fetishizing of my trans identity always trumped the the fetishizing uh, Cecilia for being uh, a sex worker, if if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If it was in regards also to um, something that I had said earlier around the police specifically, like fetishizing um, folks in the trade. I mean, I think that when we think about um, modern conceptions of criminalization, specifically of immigrant women, um, and especially um, immigrant women of color who are being policed in these ways that like Hugh is also, and Melissa is also like alluded to, right? Around, are you performing femininity, like white femininity well enough? Like, and if you can't achieve that like performative level of white femininity, um, you're probably, you know, um, uh, a threat to it and so how can we like police and cage and like squash you like what you represent and who you are and this like fixation and fetishization um i think manifests in, in all kinds of ways um and, and has been taking place right like 
over the last like even longer than 100 years um, over the century and we can look at early trafficking laws and the ways um, that those impacted and are still impacting communities of color right and especially like queer youth right of color trans youth of color how we can think about the way that they impact um, populations who are houseless um, all those things right we can also think about the way in which um, these mechanizations of, of criminalization um, are exactly like what Cecilia is pointing to, pointing to, right? Like fetishizing the body and what the body is doing and where the body belongs um, and where it doesn't belong. And yeah, I think that those are, um, seeing that play out in real time. Um, right now, I'm just immediately thinking about um, Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart and the way that he um, really has this obsessive fixated fetishization, right, of um, his work around policing folks in the trade in particular, um, and couching that in the language of rescue and savior, like being a, a savior of girls. And the language, I think, is also a tell, right, the kind of language that folks use when they talk about what people do with their bodies to survive. Um, it's, it's a really big tell, and it usually means like exactly uh, what Cecilia was pointing to earlier around this kind of like swerf turf um, connection. The language is telling. So if folks are using some particular language, big red flags. Um, and I think that's inherently linked to that kind of um, uh, the politics and ideas around the fetishization of policing, caging, and um, really like obliterating um, folk who represent this uh threat right mm -hmm. to white femininity and womanhood and, and those ideals right it's sort of about like police out being the agents of protecting this idea of innocence right and and so many women fall outside the purview of what they say is innocent if you aren't as you were saying sort of performing this perfect white femininity then you are considered a threat to that femininity and so in a way the police are there to to hold that border, right? And to sort of decide who ends up on which side of it. Um, and it's very sexualized, the policing that they're doing. So in, in the case of Tom Dart, um, you know, he was one of sort of the pioneers, and I think it's an appropriate way to use the word pioneer in the sense, um, with all of its colonial uh, associations. He was one of the very first sort of visible members of, of law enforcement um, who, advocated for police departments, municipal police departments, to spend time on websites that sex workers use to advertise, um, to infiltrate those communities in the ways that perhaps an undercover vice officer wouldn't be able to do on the streets, you know, to essentially role play as sex workers or as their customers on the internet for the purposes of making an arrest or taking that website down. And so it's very hard to separate out the policing and the sexualization when it comes to this sort of way of looking at sex work. I, uh, I you know, I, you know, and also like, you know, me as a sex worker and maybe as a trans sex worker, I always felt like I was like easy prey, right? When was the time that I was robbed by a man? It was when I was a police officer, right? When was the time where I was like, you know, taking, taking my, my, the money that I made during my night? It was by a police officer. And like also like, you know, when, when they didn't take my money because that was the only thing that they needed and I got arrested, for example, for escorting online, I remember them, uh, big uh, cis male men uh, taking my phone and pretending to be me on the phone, trying to lure clients so they could arrest more people. And I saw that spark in their eyes and it's kind of like, it was like, that, 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 that's the, the real uh, definition of fetishizing a, a profession, right? And uh, it actually made me want to vomit right now, just remembering that. That's, thank you for sharing that, Cecilia. Um, I can't even imagine. Uh, when Red said uh, something about this fetishization going back a uh, hundred years, um, I just wanted to share, uh, in 1910, New York City opened up what was called the Women's Court, and it was a court for two crimes, prostitution and intoxication, public drunkenness. Almost all of the cases were sex work related, and it was actually opened intentionally 
to be a theatrical experience for rich white people to come to. The people who designed it, the first uh, woman who ran the um, first probation officer program said that the program was designed to show people the humiliation of girls bound to a life of prostitution. For the next 10 years, people would come to the women's court for entertainment. This is a, a quote from the New York City Tribune in 1918. Chinatown or the night court, what shall it be, has been a usual after-dinner question on the part of aristocratic slummers or diners in uptown restaurants or Greenwich Village. Motors have stood for hours outside of Jefferson Market Courthouse while the occupants in evening dress have watched the tragic procession of women in turn defiant, sullen, whimpering, pass before the magistrate for sentence. Gray-haired women with shifty eyes and bold-faced little girls of 16 stand before the judge while their offense is discussed in the presence of unsympathetic and sensation-seeking spectators. And this happens in the 10 years immediately preceding the time period where we start to talk about Greenwich Village as a destination for tourists. All of this, the theatricalization of the arrests and um, engagement of women and trans masculine people arrested for sex work was viewed as entertainment. And it's part of what made Greenwich Village the entertainment district that we know it as today. And not only were they watching these women be arrested, immediately upon being found guilty, at the women's court, you were taken to a separately partitioned room where you were still in view of the audience, where you were fingerprinted on one side of a wall and then given an invasive, violent vaginal examination. All of this happened before audiences for decades in Greenwich Village. So when we talk about the fetishization of sex workers, it, Red is right, it absolutely goes back to the very founding of some of our ideas of women's justice in America. I think it's a real warning, you know, for people who think that we can, you know, make the criminal justice system like gender sensitive and that that's going to to produce a different outcome, right? And those courts exist today. There's an echo of those courts today in the, the city's human trafficking intervention courts. It has, also never... switched, it has also switched a lot into fetishizing um, uh, survivors, right? And mm -hmm. like, you know, that, you know, that, that judge that goes to bed every night thinking like I did something great, you know, I took this poor woman out of this terrible life and I gave them an opportunity because I got them to plead that they're victims of trafficking, which is like the reality is like, you know, when you're arrested by, for prostitution and you were given two choices, right? One choice is like five days in Rikers, the other choice is you say that you are a, a victim of trafficking. I'm a victim of trafficking. I'm, I'm not going to jail, right? So because of that, they give you like a couple of like uh, 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 counseling sessions, right? And that keeps inflating the numbers of trafficking victims that report that they are victims of trafficking just to avoid jail time. So that has been happening for years in, in, in trafficking courts. And that creates this sense of like saving uh, as a, and it's a new fetish for a lot of people. The thing that's that's also, I think, important for people to take from that example is it's not limited just to the trafficking courts. This idea of like using the court to provide social services or using the court to provide an alternative to incarceration when the, you know, the actual alternative to incarceration would be just don't police people, just don't arrest people, right? Like, why are you trying to solve this on the back end? I've already put somebody through the system. Amen. Right? Someone actually asked a question that sort of relates to that. Um, which is about, oh, now there's a lot of questions and I lost track of it. But the, the sense was what we can do or what is being done to increase access to healthcare and social services for sex workers in this context, um, including the context of the pandemic. I mean, sex workers are taking care of themselves like we always do. Um, incredible, expansive, beautiful displays of mutual aid, both in um, the terms of fundraising, but also getting people harm reduction supplies, um, making sure that folks, you know, have their Narcan, have their Naxalone, have their condoms. Um, I think that there's been, are able to like still talk to one another um, about best practices, right? Um, there's a group of folks who put out an amazing um, kind of best practices guide for um, sex working folks. Um, I think 
uh, one of the amazing organizers from Whose Corner Is It Anyway, Katie Simon, helped um, pin that report um, of best practices. Um, and so there, there are people who are just doing the work because it's just, it never stops, right? Um, and I also think uh, there's been some, some queer institutional support, right? Like uh, Cal and Lord has set up a pop-up clinic for sex working people that it's running through the whole, um, uh, I think it's Thursdays, um, don't quote me, it's either Tuesdays or Thursdays. Um, through the end of this month. So there are these pressure points and moments of like collective building around healthcare that are happening. Um, and also mutual aid is just ongoing, right? And because it always has to be. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's remind um, the people listening that um, Glitz New York just got $2 million to create housing for sex workers. If that is not the epitome of, of mutual aid, I don't know what is. And I have been in awe of this campaign and how amazing the organizers in Guyane and Rio did and how they move in order to create that number. It's just, it keeps me, it gives me chills off. Goosebumps, right? Yeah. Just yeah. seeing, seeing the campaign just keep, I was just, you know, every day you wake up and there's another $25,000 and it's like, and it's, you know. <laughs> it is the thing of like, you know, me as a trans woman, and I'm sure that Kayan would be able to, to relate to it too. We are very much used to crumbs, right? So when this campaign started, I was like, yeah, you know, $10,000 would be great, you know. And then like it keeps growing and it's, it's just like, you know, you can't, we, I couldn't believe it. I am just so incredibly um, happy for what is coming uh, in, in the future of Glitz, New York. And that, that's a campaign that was led by trans sex workers of color, that this is not like one big sugar daddy donor from the Ford Foundation showing up with a million dollars, right? This is sex working people who always are the first to give even when they might have the least to give. And that's, that's sort of the ethic of mutual aid. It comes around, it will come around. This is just really unusual that it's hit this level of visibility. And, and maybe that has to do with sort of the context we're in around the uprisings, people, and someone asked this question, you know, what can we do to meaningfully support trans women, like housing and supporting trans led projects like this is a huge, a huge part of that. I'm gonna pick one more question. There are so many good questions, including um, some requests to post the link to the Glitz fundraiser. Um, if someone has that handy, maybe you do. Cecilia, that. can you um, okay. link to the, the Glitz I, one and I'll link to the other ones that I mentioned? I am looking for it though. Okay. Um, I know that it's in uh, Glitz. Uh, Glitz, here it is. I'm gonna put that, I'm gonna put the website and you should be able to find uh, a donate button somewhere there. I think they are they are um, still taking donations. And um, yes, there it is. I did it. Yay. I'm, I'm going to close this on this question, which is, is kind of a tough one, but I feel like brings a lot of threads together of what we've been talking about. Um, are, are there specific approaches, the question asks, to dealing with harm and violence that sex workers have developed that might be instructive for those who are just coming towards abolition now? Um, seemingly a wide variety of people are coming towards abolition now. So I, I would say like, let's think about this in terms of like addressing violence and harm, but then also the other side of that equation when it comes to abolition, which is how do we create communities of care and repair? Don't mind if I go. Okay. go. Um, what a good question. What an amazing question. I think first thing I'd want to recommend um, are some amazing resources. Um, I think looking at all of the beautiful resources that Insight has come up with, that YWEP has come up with, um, there is a wonderful transformative justice like hub project um, that Miriam Kaba has spearheaded called transformharm.org. You can go there for wonderful resources. 
Um, so I think like a couple of things there, right? Like building out our ideas about what abolition is, right? And very decisively like what it isn't because that's a thing that's happening now in this explosive moment of folks being like, yes, abolition. Um, it's really important to know that that entails principles, right? And, and ideas. Um, there's like a, le a rich legacy to, to read and discuss, right? With, your, with folks, hopefully you're getting organized, you're plugging into grassroots organizations to help clarify your beliefs, principles, and, and organizing goals, right? In addition to doing this reading. But I think specifically stuff that sex working people have given us, um, I remember sitting at uh, a amazing workshop with Shira Hassan um, a few years ago. And, you know, Shira is like reminding everyone like sex workers gave you harm reduction. You know, like this is, this is a group that has given us this beautiful um, set of practices around how to keep each other as safe as possible um, as we negotiate risks of survival, right? Um, and so I think that we can learn a lot from that legacy, um, specifically organizing with folks um, who may use drugs um, and how we can organize uh, respectfully and with care um, in those in scenarios, how we can just show up for people. Um, but also sex workers have created uh, basically systems of, of checks, right? Um, from bad date lists um, to you know, having a safe call to um, establishing different methods of co-working um, or co-walking, um, co-living, all of these things. And they're all mechanisms to ensure um, fellow sex working people's um, survival and, and thrival, right? Being able to work, being able to take care of oneself and, and one's family. And it's also important to know that as sex workers make those things, right? As we make those things online or in person, on the fly or steeped in like research, they're under attack and they're under threat. And so it's, it becomes harder and harder to realize some of those things. And so if you are using harm reduction tactics, if you are trying to build community care outside of the cops, right, and outside of the criminal legal system, you can thank a black sex worker and a sex worker of color for giving you those rich traditions. Um, and so, yeah, like as you're doing that reading, as you're exploring resources, um, talk to people about them, get involved, plug into an organization so you have a container to explore and express those um, ideas with folks who are looking to build that better world. I mean, I have like a short anecdote that may give you an idea of, you know, what my experience is about like um, protecting um, myself and, and each other was like, you know, I, and I always like the, the only people who protect me from violence and while doing sex work were other sex workers. Um, and uh, I remember I was in my early 20s and, you know, I was like, thinking that I was the prettiest and the youngest and the fairest of them all. And uh, of course, it was another girl who thought the same things and we hated each other. And we wouldn't talk to each other and we talk shit about each other. And it was like pure shade 24 seven every time we would be together. And one time, um, uh, a man came to the bar where I was working and he started saying horrible things to me and he started coming to me and uh, held me by my arms and he was going to hit me and this person who uh, we hated each other came and just broke a chair on his back right and and that was my worst enemy at the time she was my 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 my, my enemy we hated each other uh, but I, I want to say this, and, you know, I learned that, you know, whatever situation I'm in, the person who is going to mostly going to help me is another sex worker, regardless of how much we like each other or not. Yeah, and I, I just want to say thank you to both of you. And the only thing I can add to this is that while we're listening to sex workers today, let's also listen to them historically. I, I think too often we, especially during the month of Pride, will throw around the names Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, but never actually look to their words, their organizing, their political models, what they said about gender and policing and prisons and abolition. And it's out there. 
we, we could be reading this. You know, I'm going to drop a link right in the chat right now. Thanks to Tourmaline, the amazing activist. We have this interview with Marsha P. Johnson, where she talks about Star House and mutual support and policing and gender identity and all of these things. And I think we should just as much as we reference these people in our past, we need to be listening to them too. Major key. Um, and thank you for everything in the chat. Closing thought. Yeah, let's do that. We have a little bit of time if everyone just wants to take a minute to sum up. Um, I actually had something I was going to say as a closing, so I'll just I'll say it in this space instead, which is, um, you know, speaking of sex workers giving us harm reduction, like, and, and the history of, of queer movements and sex work, I don't think I would have found sex working community without people doing work around HIV AIDS. It just wouldn't have happened. Those, those, that was the infrastructure that existed in the 90s and in the, in the 2000s. If you were going to look for sex worker community, you're probably gonna go find it at a clinic. Um, you're gonna find it with people who were working with very few resources, with a government that has turned their backs on them. This is the same story, right? Um, and, and so a lot of the lessons I think of that era that haven't been as as lifted up are the experiences of, of women with HIV AIDS, you know, people like Iris de la Cruz, who you can see very briefly in, in one of the films about ACT UP that Sarah Schulman made, um, we need to know more about. Um, you know, there, there were sex workers through that entire period as well, who were deeply stigmatized, who were facing severe criminalization, all the HIV criminalization laws that people are just starting to really meaningfully push back on in the last 10 years or so, were passed to target sex working people. So that to me is, is what I will be taking from this, like thinking back to that history and how that, that history came together and the, the tremendous debt that, that I owe to and we all owe to people who were working to fight AIDS. And anyone can jump in with their closing thoughts. My closing thought is mostly just that so much of this is, has been fascinating and incredible. And I am definitely going to be walking away from this thinking about it for a while. Uh, I, I hope that the audience feels similarly, but it does feel to me like this is a moment where things are possible. Uh, maybe because so many of us are in the streets, even when we're stuck at home. Uh, but I think largely because of the organizing that Red has been doing and Cecilia has been doing and you have been doing. Um, and I think we're starting to see the fruits of it. And I think that I hope that we keep it going. I'm just going to say like, you know, I leave my home at age 17, uh, trying to pursue my transition and who took me in uh, and gave me everything was a sex worker. And, and then I left Argentina looking for a better future. And I came to Miami and I didn't know anybody and I had $35 in my pocket and who took me in was a sex worker. And I had to leave Miami, escaping uh, an abusive relationship. And I came to New York and, um, and a, a woman gave me had, me, had me in her apartment. And when she knew that I was undocumented, rented an apartment under her name for me to leave. And she was a sex worker. Her name is Alana Starr and she lives in, in Paris right now. And I, will be forever grateful to her. So with that to say that um, the people that have helped me the most uh, are also the people who the system criminalize uh, that while helping me are uh, being criminalized for helping me. And uh, but they were the most amazing people and I owe them my life. I think since we're also anchoring this in queer history, right, during Pride Month, um, it's got to be said plainly, right? Um, and I want to, like, emphasize this, that you can't have pride without whores. You can't. It would be hollow and half-formed and that there is no queer liberation without Black liberation. Black and brown and migrant sex working people have led these queer and trans movements for liberation from the get-go, from the beginning. And whores have always been a part of organizing toward a better world. So whitewashing and pinkwashing and erasing folks from history needs to be called out for the hateful violence that it is. Um, and that's all our work. That's the work, you know? In addition to all the other movement building and organizing, naming erasure for what it is as violence is incredibly important. Because any LGBTQ 
um, rights agenda that favors marriage and the military inclusivity policies over black trans lives or over sex worker solidarity or over the freeing of our comrades from cages is not just politically like cowardly, it's an enemy worth dismantling for many of us. Um, that orientation represents a commitment to the state and to the violence of white supremacy um, over our free futures, over safe community and true supportive living that we all deserve. Um, and queer liberation seeks to realize for all of us, um, building a world without cages, without punishment, um, with celebration and not just tolerance, right? A world that affirms our lives and provides for all of our needs. That's the dream, that's the goal, that's the work, right? And, and so many folks are building that and realizing that in the now um, and creatively imagining um, abolition, right? And um, liberation. Um, and just to close, please read Against Equality and Captive Genders, everyone. Also, if you're doing some quarantine reading, please read those things. Um, in addition to every single word uh, that Cecilia Gentelli and Hugh Ryan have written and Melissa Jair Grant have written. So just, yeah, get cozy, get reading, um, find your people, do the work. Thanks again to, to all of you. You know, I could not do the work that, that I do, you know, both telling the history of where we've come from and documenting the organizing that we're seeing in the streets and all of the sort of, what we're seeing as the edges of our political imagination rapidly getting crushed into the middle and I couldn't think of a better place to be and a, a better moment to to be in it just as the city is sort of waking up just as the country is kind of waking up um, even if we can't do this in the streets and in person even if we can't go have a drink afterwards and continue the conversation forgive us um, maybe next year we'll get to have the after party. Um, just want to say really quickly before everyone goes, um, this panel was part of our new event series, TNR Live, if you missed that at the beginning. And we're going to have another event tomorrow night. Uh, my colleague Matt Ford is going to be leading an expert panel on voting at risk, talking about voting rights. This is election day here in New York uh, and many other places. This could not be more timely. Um, this recording um, will be available on our Facebook Live page. You can also tune into our Facebook Live page tomorrow night for Voting at Risk. Um, and you can register for Voting at Risk or any other TNR event by going to the events page at newrepublic.com. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a good night.